Good afternoon. My name is Christine Ferugia. I'm the Director of Research Initiatives here at the Columbia University School of Professional Studies. We're so thrilled to have you all here for the next day and a half um, for our inaugural forum on the future of work. Um, we're really looking forward to the conversations around uh, what the future of work will look like and how higher education can respond to the changing trends to help um, students and uh, learners become more employable. So our focus in this forum is really on discussions and conversations. Um, and so we ask you to listen and learn from our panelists, but also come prepared and think of your, your questions and contribute your comments and insights as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our hosts for this event. Um, Jason Wingard is the Dean of the School of, of Professional Studies, and Bob Hansen is the CEO of uh, UPSIA, the University Professional and Continuing Education Association. Uh, so Jason, I'd like to invite you up. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural convening, the Forum on the Future of Work. This is the very first one, and it's the first of many, so you'll be able to remember that you were at the first one, all right? So uh, take note of that. I just want to say thank you very much to our partner in this endeavor, UPSEA. Now, I know it's UPCEA or it's UPSEA. Bob says UPSEA, so that's what I'm going to say. Uh, they have been great, great partners. Bob is the CEO, Bob Hansen, Molly Nelson. Where is Molly? There's Molly, they have been terrific. Uh, Christine Ferugia, who just spoke to you, she's our director of research on our team, and Pam Wong, where's Pam in the back? So thank you all very much. They were the, the heartbeat behind putting all this together, and anybody that has delivered a conference knows doing the first one is, is really difficult. Uh, there's a couple reasons why we're doing this, this convening. The genesis is threefold. Number one, here at Columbia University, we are establishing a center for the future of work. It's launching this summer. We're going to be answering the question and the questions that Christine just spoke about. How is it that employers who are looking for the workforce of tomorrow can be satisfied in that skill set by the educational institutions that, in some cases, aren't providing them with the content and with uh, workforce that they need. How can we bridge that divide? Uh, so we're going to be focusing on that in our new Center for the Future of Work. So that's one impetus. The second impetus is our partner, UPSIA, has a whole nation of members who are also asking these questions. How can curriculum and instruction at the various universities be innovated so that they can satisfy the needs of the workforce? So that's the second impetus. And then the third one is we have corporate partners here at Columbia University and UPSIA as well, corporate partners around the world again, who are looking for talented workers. And when they look at the skills that they need for tomorrow, they're looking at our educational institution and saying, you all aren't doing a good enough job. You're doing what you used to do, but you're not doing what you need to be doing for the future. So that's the reason why we're doing it. Um, over the next day and a half, you're going to be hearing from a lot of people. So you're going to be hearing from uh, keynote presenters and speakers, panelists, table leaders. I want to thank all of them for being here, all of you. Uh, make sure that you engage with them. They're not here just to talk with one another. They're here to be challenged by you all uh, and to be questioned about their opinions and for, for us to have a nice, healthy academic debate here on campus. Lastly, what I'll say is the proceeds of this conference are going to be put into a book. So we'll be publishing a book on the future of work, and it'll be out later, hopefully. You never know. Uh, but hopefully by the beginning of 2020, in uh, January of 2020. So look for that book. You will all be sent a copy. I just want to thank you all all again for joining us. We're really glad you're here for this inaugural conference and let's continue to engage and be impactful. Okay, Bob? You can tell Jason's the hometown boy because everybody cheered him. He had to get you to cheer me. Thank you, Jason. Um, I do want to thank Jason and Christine and the entire Columbia team. It's been a pleasure to work with them on, on this event, but also the book project that I think is going to make it a really significant contribution to the field. I also wanted to thank my own Molly Nelson from the UPSIA staff who's worked on this um, with Christine and, and, and done such a great job. So for more than 100 years, UPSIA has advanced alter the alternative credentials agenda. It's kind of jarring to say that. It's been over 100 years. So we don't think of it that way. We think of alt-cred as perpetually new, but in fact, 
Um, it's not. What is new is context and technology. Where, and, and context um, is, is really what Jason was talking about, is really the mismatch between the over-reliance on degree programs for our economy. And as we move into the, the digital economy and the knowledge economy, that context is really has really shined a spotlight on the inadequacy, inadequacies of the current system. And then secondly, of course, technology. Technology is what makes access, um, uh, access possible as well as, as well as scale. Today is actually the second convening that we've been part of. Uh, we held a Future of the Credentials um, convening in DC at our offices at One DuPont about 18 months ago. And that was called the Future of Credentials. This is the future of work, the other side of the coin. And we're thrilled to be doing this with Columbia. Um, I think that 18 months down the road, th the momentum is gaining, is continues to, to, to be there and discernible, and I think it's, it's growing. Um, clearly, the future of work and the future of credentials must be aligned as much as possible. That's the key challenge and opportunity for our members, for our regions, for national competitiveness, and most of all, for the tens of millions of individuals who would benefit from a future in which credentials are, li are liberated from the constraints of degree milestones that do not work for too many people. They work for many of our, our folks, a lot of the children of the people in this room, they work. They don't work for everybody. And increasingly, they won't work for our children as they're gonna need to retooling uh, through their multiple careers in their, in their life. We know the credential movement cannot succeed without a focus on quality, and for this reason, I'm pleased to announce that UPSI is currently developing our third set of quality frameworks after the successful uh, Hallmarks of Excellence in Online Leadership, which was followed by the Hallmarks of Excellence in Professional and Continuing Education. Uh, we are now going to work on a third set in alternative credentials. And I think this signals in many, signals in many ways that alternative credentials are coming of age. Um, uh, and, uh, much like online education was coming of age about 10 to 15 years ago. If you remember the Babson studies, the, fam the, the annual Babson studies they used to do with OLC about 15, 20 years ago, they were tracking provosts' um, uh, opinions about online. And it began as negligible. It grew over time to the point where virtually everybody had to have a strategic plan for online. I think that's in this, uh, an analogous situation to where we are right now uh, with alternative credentials. I see a dramatic increase of interest in our members. UPSIA benchmarking research bears that out. And I think, again, it, it is accelerating. Um, I think the new hallmarks of excellence will draw from models of best practice that are working from a variety, because unlike online and professional continuing education, although there's a little bit there, there's such, um, it is such a, a um, um, uh, ambiguous space in alternative credentials with so many different models. So uh, some work for different institutional types, some might work for a unit, some might work for a city that don't work for, that, that don't work as well for a rural area. So I think this, this quality framework is going to have to be flexible and focus on models rather than a model. And as this project moves forward, we'll be reaching out to many of you, or most of you, maybe all of you um, in, in, who are here today for your input and feedback and guidance. And with that, I just want to thank Columbia one more time. I look forward to meeting as many of you here as possible in the next day and a half, and, and thank you for coming. Great, thank you, Jason and Bob. So we have a wonderful first session today focused on the leadership landscape um, in the future of work. So this session focuses on the big picture changes that are coming in the future of work and what that means for business leaders. Um, our first presenter is Jonathan Law, uh, who's a partner at McKinsey and & Company. And John is going to share with us McKinsey's in-depth research on the future of work and also share some insights about what the implications are for higher education. Followed by Jonathan's presentation, we will then move into a panel discussion, uh, which includes several uh, distinguished, distinguished executives. Um, we've got Mike Ulica, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of National Geographic Soci Society. Uh, Matt Patinsky, the CEO of Parchment and a co-founder of Blackboard. 
and, as well as Carrington S. Carter, who is Senior Director of Enterprise Inclusion and Diversity at TIAA. Um, and we're very pleased to have moderating that panel discussion will be Lauren Web Weber from the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I've given just very brief intros here, but I encourage you all to look on the conference website to, to uh, read their full bios and see all the wonderful achievements that they've, they have. Uh, so with that, I'm going to welcome Jonathan Law to the podium. Thank you, Christine, and thank you to Columbia and Upsia for uh, having me today and, and putting on this fabulous event. Uh, my name is Jonathan Law. Uh, as Christine mentioned, I'm a partner at McKinsey & Company based here in New York. I'm also the uh, leader of our global higher education practice. Uh, and it's good to be back at Columbia. I was a graduate of the law school many years ago. Um, I come at this from a couple of different angles. I uh, in, in lead our higher education practice globally, so work with a lot of higher ed institutions, all kinds of different higher ed institutions on a variety of different topics related to strategy, operations, student attraction, retention, and success, research excellence, um, online, and the like. Um, I also work with uh, any number of government and nonprofit entities around workforce development issues. Um, and so this particular topic is very close to my heart and uh, I think is an incredibly important topic uh, that this group is tackling, which is uh, very, very exciting. Um, so I was asked to provide some of the fact base on the future of work and, and the view of employers. And uh, what I'll be doing today is bringing some of the research from McKinsey's Global Institute, which is McKinsey's economics think tank um, focused on the evolution of the global economy. Uh, much of this research uh, you may have seen before, it's all available online. It's a major thrust of the, the work that MGI is doing these days, and um, uh, I would encourage you to take a look if you haven't had a chance. There are three topics in particular that I'd love to touch on today. Uh, first, the rapid progress in artificial intelligence, which has led to widespread adoption across industries and how it's changing the nature of business. Second, I'd love to lay out the implications on the nature of jobs and the way humans work. And then third and finally, I would love to start considering the implications for higher education, what some of um, the things that higher ed might need to do to reform itself. Let's begin by talking about what we mean by uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and robotics, and how it's transform, uh, transforming industries globally. So what do we mean by AI? We typically talk about it as five technology systems. We're talking about computer vision, natural language processing, cognitive agents, uh, robotics, and autonomous vehicles. And all of this is undergirded um, by machine learning and deep learning. So that, that is fundamentally what is the, the, the types of technologies that are transforming uh, the nature of work um, that, that's undergirding all of this. And in many respects, machines can now uh, exceed human performance across many different types of activities. Here you can see how machines have surpassed human ability to recognize images. There are similar examples I'm sure you've seen around games like chess and Go. Now, th there is one cautionary note, of course, this is not uniformly true. Machines are not better than humans at most things, and there's still uh, a long ways to go. That said, artificial intelligence is being <laughs> Sure. Uh, artificial intelligence is being uh, applied in, across um, many, many different um, activities. Um, and, you know, it, it is being applied across different business domains here, as you can see, from research and development to customer service, from operations to sales and marketing. And uh, there, there are different, uh, different kinds of technologies that are being deployed and they're being uh, adopted in, in different areas. But we looked at 400 different use cases and this is, this is what we found as we looked at how uh, AI is being uh, adopted by industry. And companies are across sectors and across geographies are seeing very, very positive results in terms of performance. MGI calculates that artificial intelligence could raise productivity growth by 0.8 to 1.4 percentage points over the next 40 years in GDP, uh, GDP growth. That, to put it in perspective, is more than the steam engine in its heyday from 1850 to 1910, or the IT revolution in the 1980s to early 2000s in terms of the productivity bump that were received by those two particular revolutions. 
And of course, AI is not just changing business outcomes, it's also fundamentally altering the way we as humans do our work. In this portion of the presentation, I'd love to paint the overall picture on labor force displacement, but then talk a, a little bit about who specifically is gonna be affected, what sectors and occupations will look like in the future, and how the impacts are gonna be felt geographically, all again based on research done by the McKinsey Global Institute. The top line message here is that based on a detailed review of all activities that humans do today, matched with available technologies today, MGI estimates that machines could do 50% of our work. That doesn't mean that they will or that they should, simply that they could. However, and very importantly, less than 10% of jobs can be fully automated with technologies that exist today. So to give an example, automation has the potential to displace 69% of the work that paralegals do today. But that doesn't mean that paralegals are gonna get eliminated as they will also spend time in new activities alongside where there's deployment of artificial intelligence. That all said, as we looked across occupations, few jobs will not be affected by automation or have the potential to be affected by automation. Sewing machine operators, as you can see from the left here, have the potential to be fully automated. But even some parts of what surgeons and engineers do today have the potential for uh, automation, as you can see. Overall, 60% of occupations have 30% of tasks that are automatable. In other words, more than half of occupa uh, occupations that exist today have the technical capacity for one third of their tasks to be automated. With all this disruption in employment, the question most often asked is, will there be jobs in the future and will there be enough jobs? The short answer from us is we're co quite confident that the answer is yes. Our estimate is that while 39 million jobs could be displaced by automation in the next 10 to 15 years in the US, those jobs are likely to be replaced, and then some, from both growth areas in the economy and demographic changes in the labor force. Now, there are different scenarios, of course, and, and we've modeled this across different scenarios. What I've shown is the midpoint scenario, and what you can see up here on the slide are what some of the scenarios depend on in terms of um, the pace of artificial intelligence and, and adoption and the like. And this notion of scenarios is an important one and a cautionary point for all of us. There are several factors that affect the speed and scope of automation and also its adoption. First, there's the technical uh, feasibility of automation and the pace of the breakthroughs. The technology, of course, has to be invented, it has to be integrated and adapted in solutions that automate specific activities. Second is around the cost of developing and deploying these solutions. There needs to be a strong business case for these technologies to be adopted in the first place. Third is around labor market dynamics. The quality, quantity, as well as supply, demand, and costs of human labor as an alternative affect which activities will actually be automated. Fourth, the economic benefits need to be uh, uh, accounted for. In addition to labor cost savings, business case for automation could include performance gains such as increased profit, increased throughput and productivity, improved safety, and higher quality, which sometimes exceeds the benefits. And then finally, there are of course regulatory and social acceptance factors around whether what can be automated will in fact be automated. So if that's the top line message, the next question I'd love to address is who will be affected by automation? First, it's important to note that automation might have an effect on all kinds of different occupations. This chart simply shows what portion of an occupation might be automated compared to what the pay scale is for that occupation. As you can see, occupations across wage scales will be impacted. Uh, and it, it, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between um, uh, the wage scale and the, the uh, amount of the job that can be automated. However, our analysis suggests that middle wage jobs are le most likely to be affected negatively. We basically looked here at three tranches of occupations by wage levels. The lowest wage jobs are likely to grow 2%, as you can see here. Middle wage jobs are likely to contract by 8% or 5 to 10 million jobs. 
is over the period between uh, now and 2030. And then highway jobs are, are projected to grow by 13%. Again, this is uh, affected by a number of different factors that you would want to consider. But this is just a cautionary note around what wage levels are going to be most impacted by automation. We also looked at how men and women could be impacted and found, interestingly, that the potential for job losses and gains could be broadly similar for men and women. This analysis looked at a sample of 10 countries around the world. The similar impacts are due to uh, automation, are, are because automation is not just about robots and factories, but it's much more pervasive than that. It could impact sectors as diverse as retail and financial services, where you have different concentrations of men and women. We also looked at future job opportunities, and given where growth is coming from, the job gains are likely to mostly offset the potential job losses, as you can see, by, by gender. However, while the overall picture might look roughly comparable for men and women, the underlying drivers of jobs lost and gained are actually quite different. So for jobs displaced globally, plant and machine workers would, could, could account for, on average, 40% of men's jobs being lost, compared to only 15% of women's roles, which is reasonably intuitive. Uh, service, sales, and clerical work could drive more than 50% of women's jobs being lost, but only 25% for, for men. In terms of jobs gained, you see a similar story. Healthcare could be a top producer of jobs for women, accounting by itself for, on average, a quarter of women's jobs created, compared to just 7% for men. Manufacturing, on the other hand, could drive, on average, over 25% of men's increased job demand, compared to 17% for women. We've also looked at the impacts on African Americans, and the story here is different than the story on gender. Our analysis here focused on what we call directive versus supportive occupations. Directive occupations include managers, professionals, and salespeople. Support roles include administrative support, laborers, and service workers. The data show that African Americans are disproportionately concentrated in support roles versus in directive roles. Those support roles are both growing at a slower rate and earn much less than directive roles. Now, when you layer on the risk of automation, you'll see that those support roles are much more at risk uh, in, in the supportive roles than they are in the directive roles. We give two examples here to bring it to life. Truck drivers, a supportive role, versus software developers, a traditionally directive role. You can see how overrepresented African Americans are among truck drivers today, and how underrepresented they are among software developers. 81% of truck driving tasks can be automated, while only 15% of software development can be automated. So suffice to say that African Americans are likely to be disproportionately impacted by automation given the current mix of occupations. Moving on from the impacts on people, we'd love to talk about what sectors and occupations are going to be most affected and how. First, industries vary in terms of activities that are automatable. On this chart at the top, more than half of the tasks associated with accommodation, food services, and manufacturing can be automated, as you can see. At the bottom, only 31% of activities in the education sector can be automated. And I suppose that is good news for people in this room. <laughs> As just a side note, that across sectors, the deployment of AI isn't just about substituting labor. It's also about improving quality and performance. And here, what we've done is taken a crack based on use cases around what actually delivers more, uh, what, where does automation actually deliver more performance gains versus a pure labor substitution? And here you can see across different sectors, the pattern is, uh, varies, but you can see consistently that performance gains provide more of the rationale than just pure lo labor su substitution as a reason for pursuing automation. From the pe perspective of occupations, we are likely to see some categories grow care providers, managers, builders, as you can see from this chart. There are, of course, likely to be other occupations that decline in growth. 
Those are roles with interactions with customers, office support, et cetera. Up to 26 million, we estimate that up to 26 million Americans may need to change occupational groups by 2030, as you can see here. As we look at these displacements, we also looked at the range of different educational attainment that's associated with the roles that are being displaced. What you can see here is in the blue and in some of the orange, uh, sorry, in, in the blue, yes, and uh, the light blue, these are occupations that typically um, uh, are less likely to require a college degree versus the orange and the red. Finally, I want to say a quick word about the geographic impacts of automation and the future of work. MGI has pushed this analysis, not just at a people level, but actually down to a county by county level across the United States. And what you get is a, a beautiful map like this, which is just simply showing the blue areas are projected to grow the number of jobs in the next 10 to 15 years whereas the orange areas will have slow to negative job growth. The upshot here is that rural areas are projected to continue their trend, their current trend of losing jobs, whereas urban areas and, and urban adjacent areas are gonna benefit most is, is, the, is the notion. I don't think this is any of a surprise. However, it is quite stark when, when you look at it on the map, but also you can drill down county by county to see what those impacts might be. Given that we're in New York City, uh, we thought that we'd take a quick look at how this breaks out in New York City and its five boroughs. And what you can see is that job growth is projected to come primarily in the Bronx, uh, Queens, and Brooklyn here. Interestingly, um, New York City is projected overall to have a lower net job growth um, compared to its peers in other megacities across the U.S. So what does this all mean for higher education? First, we are seeing a large shift in the mix of skills required today versus those that will be needed in the future. What you see from the chart that I've put up here is that physical and manual skills, as well as basic cognitive skills, are declining in demand, and they're declining significantly. These will be increasingly insufficient as a core skill set as machines take over straightforward data input tasks and the need shifts to higher cognitive skills. We will also see a sharp rise in technological skills, of course, which you can see at the bottom there. But importantly, we are also going to see an increase in the need for social and emotional skills. This suggests a profound shift in terms of the, kind, the mix of skills that learners and eventually workers are going to need in the workforce. And so one thing we like to talk about is the difference between IQ, EQ, and AQ. IQ, or technical skills and knowledge, are gonna be changing several times within a career in terms of what a worker is going to need, whether that's things like software development or design skills, product management, and the like. In terms of EQ, machines will be doing, doing important knowledge work, so these socio-emotional skills will become even more important. These are things like creativity, critical thinking and problem solving, social intelligence, communication and influence. And then finally, AQ, or adaptability quotient, is going to be what will be increasingly necessary. Here we're talking about uh, an aspiration for lifelong learning, a growth mindset, a strong sense of self-direction and comfort with ambiguity and change over time. This is what we believe is where the world is going in terms of what students need to learn. And it suggests a profound shift um, uh, in, in those skills, but also pro uh, potentially profound change in the way higher education operates. Before talking about what higher ed needs to do, I might just suggest that we have reason to be optimistic. We as a society have adapted in prior areas where there's been massive skills shifts in the past. This sometimes gets forgotten, but it's worth, it bears worth repeating. We were able to increase enrollment rates of teenagers from less than 20% to over 70% within 30 years in high school. And this helped to actually move us into an age of, of universal education, universal skills, basic skills. Similarly, with the introduction of the GI Bill, the number of US college students rose by a factor of eight 
over 25 years. Again, a massive shift in our society. I'm an optimist at heart and so would like to believe that we've been able to do this before and we are able to do it again, particularly as a higher ed sector. So what are those things that would need to change? To be somewhat provocative, I've suggested that there are potentially 10 different shifts for higher education and suggest these as thought starters and welcome other ideas. First, doubling down on diversity given the disproportionate impacts of uh, automation and the future of work on different populations. Um, it was interesting when I was uh, uh, brainstorming this with some colleagues, this list, one of my colleagues suggested that doubling down is actually not even close to being enough given how higher ed isn't doing enough today on diversity and, and the point is well taken. Second, innovating student funding and payment modes models so as to account for new needs. One could imagine what would an individual learning account look like for life for people to reskill themselves continually um, through adulthood. Third, expanding curricula offerings and alternative credentials as well, and importantly, engaging employers so that what is being taught in the classroom is meeting labor market needs. Fourth, we talked about the different kinds of skills um, basic cognitive not being necessary, higher cognitive being necessary, but also the socio-emotional skills. Making sure that those are being taught in the classroom along with the content that's being delivered. Fifth, importantly, supporting faculty on innovative pedagogical methods. This is not necessarily natural to the current um, crop of, of faculty, so how do we ensure that we transform the way that faculty teach in the classrooms? Sixth, we should transform career services. In many places today, they are simply a reactive job broker. Instead, they should be a critical part of the student experience from beginning to end, and how do we think about embedding that from the moment that a student walks through the front doors? Seventh, reimagining the, 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 the contract, if you will, between higher ed institutions and their students and alumni. And I mean this about going beyond lifelong learning. We often talk about lifelong learning and it's become quite the buzzword. But how do we think about what are the, the, the mutual um, uh, uh, commitments that are being made between institution and student? And how does a, 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 an institution, an higher ed institution, actually engage alumni beyond just asking them for more donations? Eighth. Research is obviously incredibly important and, and will continue to have to inform um, how we think about this transition into the new world. And so research, particularly on economic and social policies, will be incredibly important to inform the, the public debate and policy making. Ninth, on a slightly related but different note, how do how, higher ed should be providing insights to policymakers on what will help them as institutions to better meet student needs. We, in many ways, still have the regulatory regime that is in a GI Bill world, essentially, for higher ed. So how do we shift again to this new, new world we are seeing? And then 10th and final thought and slight provocation here is that universities should ad uh, adopt and, and embrace artificial intelligence and automation technologies in the work that they do and in their campuses. And so, of course, you want to do this with, with privacy and security and, and ensuring that there is um, no bias. But how do we think about deploying these technologies in the world that we work in so that we are living with them day in and day out and understand them um, in a concrete sort of way? Those are 10 thought starters uh, to, to spur discussion. Um, don't know if folks will violently disagree or think it's uh, woefully um, uh, lacking in terms of what, what is needed for the challenge. But thank you much um, for, for your time. Those are some uh, initial thoughts just around uh, the future of work and, and what higher ed can do. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, that was very powerful data and uh, very provocative suggestions for higher education. Um, so I'd now like to invite the panelists and our moderator to come up to the stage uh, for the next portion. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I kind of personify one trend at work right now, which is called, which is the just-in-time trend. I was asked to moderate this panel at about 4 o'clock yesterday. So um, I think more and more labor will be um, deployed in that way in the future. Um, I want to start out by t asking the panelists to identify, I mean, Jonathan just laid out many trends and many things that are affecting the workplace. I want to ask each of the panelists to identify one thing. It can be something that's already been discussed or uh, something else. One trend that's having the greatest impact at your own workplace, or um, we have Matt here from Parchment. You have, your company employs about 150 people, but you, you are kind of an intermediary in a lot of ways in between higher ed and employers. So if not in your own workplace, then sort of in the, in the world that you observe and that you live in every day. Um, Carrington, do you want to start? Um, so uh, I'm Carrington Carter with uh, TIAA, and I uh, work with our enterprise uh, DNI team supporting our TFS business. So uh, I think Jonathan said uh, a whole lot of it, um, but I think one of the things that um, we're seeing in our industry is consistent with what Catalyst spoke to, I think, in 2018, whereby uh, 2022, 75% of the workplace will be made up of Millennials and Gen Z. So I think we're getting to a point where we have multiple generations within the workplace. And that trend creates um, an interesting dynamic in the workplace. It requires that leaders um, are uh, purposefully inclusive uh, and able to bring and share multiple perspectives. So that's the one that comes to mind for me. Okay, Matt? So I'm the CEO of a company in education that writes software and sells it. So I feel safe right now. <laughs> if I read all the different cells, I'm in the best, uh, the best spot. Um, you know, I'm glad you raised that because um, I was thinking through those implications and to play off that joke a little bit, sure, artificial intelligence, the specific technologies that were outlined are having an effect on parchment as a workplace. It also has profound effects for how we think about the kind of value we can add to our universities through our data. It opens up a whole new you know, scope of service. But probably the thing that we are experiencing most that's changing our work environment is actually what you laid out, which is the generational change in the compact that employees expect of their employers. It's a very different mindset, and it affects a lot of different ways in which we think about how we recruit and develop our people. Yeah, I, I'm Mike Yolica at National Geographic Society and uh, very happy to be here uh, today. Um, you know, I think we are dealing very similar with this on, on the diversity. Um, as, as you're hearing, the workforce today is, is pretty much in balance when you look at age disbursement, gender disbursement, um, race, ethnicity. But uh, as, as your chart showed very clearly, it's out of balance when it comes to who's leading and making those decisions and who's following and, and, and leads. So we're very focused on in the inclusion and how do we go about recruiting at levels that we can bring those, uh, those di different genders and diversity in at a higher level and develop them quickly within the organization. And uh, it's, it's a challenge we're dealing with. So at McKinsey, um, you know, we're shifting the way that we recruit and the kind of talent that we need to bring. And it's really driven by the needs of our clients. So historically, if you think about the consulting industry and McKinsey specifically 50 years ago, we would hire generalists from uh, MBA programs. Uh, today, that is uh, the, the mix of the talent that we have at McKinsey, but also um, where we recruit from and the type of people that we recruit is fundamentally different. Uh, and this is all based on what kinds of uh, capabilities that our clients need. So we have um, technologists now that uh, are highly specialized. Um, we have uh, a whole cadre of folks who are steeped in design thinking, um, advanced analytics. We have over 2,000 data scientists now at the, at the firm, which um, all they're focused on is, is how do you actually deploy some of these technologies that we're talking about, um, whether it's machine learning and deep learning. Uh, to solve our clients' uh, problems. And, and that is actually a fundamental shift in, in um, our workforce and, and how we're looking as a firm. Um, you talked a lot about soft skills. And honestly, when I talk to employers, which is pretty much what I do all day, 
it's rare that I have people say they can't find people with the technical skills. And I think especially in this, in, in this uh, low unemployment environment, companies are willing to do a lot of that training. Um, but it's the soft skills that they have a hard time training on. Where, uh, where is the breakdown happening? I'm not quite sure where, you know, where should people be learning those skills and be developing those skills? And why is it not happening? So, I mean, to start off, if we think about the role of higher education, its relationship with the economy is just one of the purposes, right? It's also the relationship with our democracy and the relationship with our society. And so I start with the predisposition that we are a better economy than society. Um, and um, democracy, the more people who have a liberal arts education than not. I build on that, and I'm glad you raised that. When I see a presentation like this, the implication that I get is it's a fool's errand to chase the immediate relevancy of skill gaps in the main for higher education, which isn't to say that there aren't programs and parts in terms of alternative credentialing that are very well focused on that. But in the main, it just reinforces the value of a liberal arts education as an evergreen contribution in the life course of learning that someone goes through with other parts of the university as well, other parts of our economy, the employer, and a whole ecosystem of education and training providers focusing on the hyper-relevance. So I have a similar kind of puzzle uh, response to it, which is the more things change, doesn't that suggest that the role of higher education in the main, those degree programs, especially when you think about critical thinking skills, emotional intelligence, et cetera, um, I want people who can write well, speak well, think analytically, or comfortable with numbers, reinforces the value of a liberal arts degree as opposed to questions its relevance. So um, I, I agree with everything that Matt said. Um, I think that I would add to that is that while historically there has been a dependence on higher ed, and realistically for the foreseeable future there still is, there is still an inherent um, responsibility for employers, right? Because the, rec the reality is, is that um, the companies have been that have been successful have gone out and recruited strategic, innovative thought leaders, people with creativity and critical thinking skills and emotional intelligence. And so you have that body of knowledge and experience. So how do you then leverage that and start to use forms within your organizations to educate? So I think it's, it's a two-pronged approach that can be taken, and probably more. Yeah, and on, on soft skills and uh, you know, working for a, a nonprofit, um, there's there's an emotional connection. People want to be there because they're connected to the mission. They're there to serve the mission, not necessarily to serve profits or shareholders. So it's a different mindset. And you know the the training has all been about how do we make them better employees. But what new employees are coming in with their own values now, which uh, is not necessarily what you know companies like National Geographic, 131 years old, has uh, has needs to adapt to. And as they bring, you, bring those values in, they need other skills like change management. We, we're, we're focused a lot on change management now, which you, know, you think of technology companies that have worked the past, that change management means something different. It's how we're gonna adapt to that new software. But we're adapting to the new workplace and the new uh, students coming in. And also, like say, for the educators, you know, geospatial thinking is, is very critical. I mean, you know, National Geographic has geography in its name, but it's more than just places on a map and where states are. And, I mean, it's really what's happening in this in this world right now on this planet, from climate change and uh, and what and the migrations that's happening, human migration, and all of that needs to be thought about in uh, in the new workforce. I, I would just say, um, in terms of higher ed, I think you know it's a lot of what uh, higher higher ed at its best does in terms of teaching um, these so-called soft skills. I think. It's not necessarily even the content that's being delivered in a particular class, but the way it's being delivered or being taught. So doing group projects, for example, helps to build those kind of uh, communication skills and the interaction skills. Um, the way that exams are structured or projects are structured um, and going you know, beyond multiple choice, it's things that has and are done today in higher ed. It perhaps just could be done uh, more pervasively and uh, uh, done in, in using the latest techniques and, and technologies. So I just think it's, it's something that uh, it's, we've known how to do all along. It's perhaps something that just needs to be um, focused on a little bit more uh, and, and push, the, push the edges on it. 
And then I think it's the responsibility of higher education to surface that. That's where I think, I mean, obviously universities could do a better job in the quality of learning, could do a better job in the cost structure, I mean, all of those things that are part of what creates a pressure around not everyone should get a degree. But I taught sociology of education and research methods. None of my students were gonna be sociologists of education, or maybe one, if I was <laughs> successful, um, in inspiring them. But again, the point of the course was to write well, speak well, think analytically, be comfortable with numbers. They, I know those because that was my opening lecture. And then sociology of education is just the context to develop those skills. Um, and, but when someone graduates, their academic transcript says, they took sociology of education. So I think it's the translation. Um, you know, if we're going to say that there's real value in the liberal arts degree in inculcating these skills that are so important, then we have to be able to communicate at some competency level the degree to which someone is graduating with those skills, and that's the translation. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'd also be remiss not to say that it, it also doesn't just start in college. You know, sure. the, these skills start getting developed much, much earlier. And I, I, I think gratefully often of my sophomore high school English teacher who taught me the structure of writing a paper, which I then used my first paper in college and then threw out because I, I'd, you know, I understood the model. Anyway, so uh, we don't have a lot of K, K to 12 people here, I'm sure, but uh, it's a, certainly a conversation that they're a part of. Um, you, a couple of you brought up generational issues in the workplace, and I'm, and I'm glad you did. And, uh, it makes me think of how um, we were writing a lot of stories a few years ago about how more and more companies were offering career path resources because millennials were demanding it. Um, and it was kind of, we were writing about it as a perk. I don't think it's a perk anymore. I don't think it's optional for employers. I think it's becoming more and more of a responsibility. And um, I was telling one of you earlier, I think a lot about people in mid-career and how uh, you know, they need those resources as much as younger workers. In fact, maybe even more so because hopefully younger workers are getting, you know, they, they already understand they're gonna be changing careers a lot. So you know, either in your perspectives as employers or observers of these, uh, of the labor market, you know, talk a little bit about the role or who, you know, the, whose responsibilities and roles, you know, it is to help people think about lifelong careers. Yeah. Well, I, I think it starts with the, with, with the employer, um, has to recognize that that's something that uh, is being demanded of and, and rightfully deserved of. And so creating those opportunities for uh, employees of, of all levels, whether they're career employees or they just entered the organization, and give those opportunities and also then it's on the individual to also take advantage of those opportunities but the employer i think it starts there given those those opportunities given the time that they need to to take those um, learning resources and i think with this with this new workforce as well um, you know right now i think they represent about 25 percent of the workforce and you know eventually they're going to be 100 uh, percent as as things graduate but giving them a voice early on in their career. So when they come in, and I think somebody mentioned collaborative type of work experience, which you know is a little bit of a buzzword, but it's actually necessary to hear their ideas because some organizations, and particularly nonprofits, aren't, aren't growth organizations. They pretty much have the same level of funding every year. How they spend their money is how you know, they get the creativity and the, uh, the, the new employees and older employees to really be excited about coming to work every day. But those new employees are gonna leave if they don't see they have that opportunity for voice. So I think giving them that outlet is very important. So I, I, think, the, um, I think businesses um, and, and organizations, and I'm proud to say ours is one of those, um, has a responsibility that as we see, you know, what Jonathan spoke to in terms of disruption in the workplace, to make sure that we are being thoughtful and proactive and making sure that our employees at all levels in the organization have an appreciation for what that disruption might mean for them. And having that same conversation, of course, in, in, in boardrooms and in strategic settings. And then to, from uh, the associate's responsibility, it's once you have that access to that information, to then do your own assessment and match that against your aspirations. And, and what, what's the gap? And then to look at the opportunities um, that your organization or externally provides you. And then lastly, um, my own view, um, is I think that from a, a government's perspective, it is to create the appropriate incentives for the business and the individual, recognizing that if they don't, there are economic implications for all. What's interesting is, um, 
I might ask my fellow panelists whether business is actually doing enough around this and, and supporting workers around their own journey. Um, we're seeing new experiments uh, around these kind of supports. In Colorado, there's the Governor's Coaching Corps, which is trying to help uh, middle skill workers think about what their career transitions are like. And, and you now see government trying to step into the breach um, where there may be actual gaps. Uh, in the thought stars that I had laid out, I, I wonder whether higher education and whether institutions where students have, have paid uh, large sums of money to, to, to not just for training for jobs, but actually to get an education, whether they have any obligation. And, and I think that's a worthwhile question to explore around what is that obligation, that mutual obligation that um, higher ed institutions have, uh, as well as students. That's not to take employers off the hook, just to say, um, what are new models and different models that might actually uh, work just as well, if not better? Um, <clears throat> I, I uh, recently quoted a source saying, why isn't there a Waze for your career? Waze is the navigation app. And I just, I think about that all the time. Um, you know, and your presentation was really about how technology is disrupting the workplace. Why aren't we deploying technology better to give people resources? There, we have so much information out there. I still don't quite understand why I can't go to some website either owned by the government or owned by, uh, you know, a higher ed institution or, you know, not necessarily, I, I don't know who's the owner, right owner of this. Put in my resume, my LinkedIn profile, whatever, say I'm, able, I'm willing to invest $5,000 in reskilling. I've got six months part time. You know, you could put in a lot of information why isn't there a program yet that spits out, here are your options? I mean, I don't know if any of you have an answer That's to that. For and I'm, you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> somebody here should do it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. When you first said it, my my reaction was, you know, that's where analogy sometimes can kind of seduce you to think things. You know, there's a fixed start, there's a fixed destination, and career pathways aren't there that way, right? People are complicated, there's serendipity. Um, and I'm not sure I'd want to live in a world where the pathways are as prescriptive. You know, one thing we always have to think about, and I think about this a lot with alternative credentialing, is it's fine to break down the degree, but if we break down the degree in a way, you know, it, very quickly pathways can look like tracks. And we know over many years, you know, in the high school context, how tracks all of a sudden replicate, you know, by race and by class, particular pathways, um, you know, that, that starts to become a little bit um, pernicious. So originally my response was, you know, that's, that's you know, it's, it's more complicated, but, you know, as you finish what you were saying, I do think increasingly, I mean, I see this in the high school to college side, where most 16, 17, 18 year olds are not very rational in thinking about where they want to be eventually in life to then shape their college selection, those who are studying outside of, you know, their local region, which is a minority. Um, but, but increasingly, I do think we're able to make transparent through data the relationship between individual attributes and their experiences and the kinds of organizations and careers that they've been exposed to to start creating a set of ranges that at, at best show you the degree to which your skills and experiences, if just you slightly imagine it a little bit to the left and the right, open up a whole different set. You know, Burning Glass is a great example of that where they do a very good job of showing how these skills if you just thought a little bit differently and maybe added just these two things, all of a sudden, all of this opens up to you. And I do think that's a world that will be increasingly true over the next five to 10 years. The CEO of Burning Glass was the one who said, why isn't oh, there a way to your career? <laughs> well, that might have been I'm a self quote them to make <laughs> but, Yeah, I think he's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody well. else want to comment on that? I mean, I would just say, I think it is ripe for disruption in that space. And, and yeah. um, I, don't, I, I agree with Matt. I don't think that it's a one-to-one -one you know, there is one path. However, um, there is a lot of data out there. Uh, it is not shared in such a way that it is helpful and useful to individuals. And that's where I think, that, you know, this notion of how do you match actual data and algorithms and, and that with the human touch, right, around how do you have folks from your employer who actually can help you interpret the data, help understand you, and, and it's kind of the art and science then coming together. That, I think, is where the power is. Um, uh, you know, someone who's sitting in the seat, car seat next to you who's helping you to interpret which is the best way, so to speak. Uh, that, I think, is, is where the future is and um, is, is, again, I think it's ripe for disruption and, and someone to do it that way. Um, 
Yeah, I, but I think, and I think there are some companies that are that are being very innovative and trying things like that. Many of them are consulting firms who, you know, they're talent businesses. Um, but I think I, if you're not fortunate enough to work for a big company with a lot of money and resources to put towards these kinds of um, this kind of guidance or um, you know data analysis, uh, you're you're really kind of out there on your own. Um, and that's, you know, another uh, quote that I re always remember from a source from a recent story said, we're asking people to navigate an increasingly complicated labor market. And I think that's true not only because the pace of change is so fast, there are new jobs emerging uh, regularly, there are old jobs that are becoming obsolete, but also they have so many options for upskilling and reskilling. You can go to LinkedIn Learning, you can do a boot camp, you can um, do MOOCs, you can go to a community, you know, there are so many op options out there. And I think this gets to some of the credentialing issues that Bob brought up earlier, which is we're, we don't have a lot of resources to help people navigate that. Um, and part of it is making more data transparent, making, get, making uh, outcomes information available to the public, um, you know, and, and that, I don't know who coordinates all of that. I mean, Matt, Matt you're in the sort of credentialing business. Yeah, I mean, an aspiration of ours is if you can observe enough credential activities, you could begin to associate, you know, many different people or many different credentials, you know, nursing, you could get something at your community college, you can get the degree you can get skilled through the hospital. There's so many different, and so what is the real, for lack of a better term, exchange value uh, of those credentials for the individual, which is ultimately gonna be about, I think coming back to an earlier comment, um, the degree to which employers are willing to invest in understanding the skills that they need and the degree to which a credential really is predictive of those skills such that um, the investment in it means it's going to be a quality signal that, um, you know, that kind of aligns the system. I'm speaking very abstractly, but we're, we're not going to really understand in a more complicated credentialing environment where you can go to MOOCs and go, you know, to LinkedIn Learning and all these different places, what the real value of that education is until employers connect the dots between the people they hire with those credentials and the performance or skills of those people. And that's not something that they've historically done. Literally, they don't track it. And if they do, it's not something they've been willing to share and bring out to the world, um, which is needed. I don't know if the data that you collect shows this, but are you seeing employers being more open to alternative credentials? I don't, we were not in a position to be able to okay. say one way or the other. Yeah, we, we do a, a little bit different type of credential at National Geographic. So we, we fund, uh, through our grants program, um, about seven to 800 grantees a year, and we call them our explorers. So they're scientists, they're journalists, they're photographers, they're technologists. And we know that they lack some of the skills, like scientists aren't very good storytellers. So we actually run for them a storytelling boot camp. And we bring these scientists in, we teach them really how to articulate what their what their findings are, what their discoveries are, because they're, they're not only putting it into a journal, a scientific journal that their peers will read, but more and more, how do we get that to the public? And they're the best voices to do that. So we have a program where we almost credential them along the way, so when they get larger and larger grants, they've had that early on training. And I think, again, Matt mentioned earlier about writing skills being so important, uh, and those basic liberal arts um, really does go a long way, even in today's workforce. A couple of you have mentioned the, val the importance of uh, diversity in, in the workforce, not just in terms of um, getting your work done, but also you know, some of the slides that you put up in your presentation were um, very striking. Um, and this economy, having a low unemployment economy, has been great for many communities that have previously been shut out of labor markets. People with criminal records have more opportunities. I hear all the time from nonprofit organizations that are kind of intermediaries between employers and uh, individuals looking for work, doing a lot of training and almost acting as staffing agencies. Um, but I worry about what happens when unemployment starts going back up. How do we sort of preserve some of the gains that are happening? Other, you know, we're, there's obviously the message, this is important, and I think the business case for diversity has been made clearly. I'm not sure everyone is convinced, but how do you keep the gains going? Well, I think um, 
it, it starts really um, at the top of the organization, right? So your, your trustees, your board of directors, your CEOs, um, and, and the folks in the C-suite, and the folks that actually have the decision-making ability, um, ensuring that that is a top priority for them, and that that vision and that expectation is, is widely known in the organization. Then once you do that, is ensuring that you hold leaders accountable for creating environments that are inclusive, right? And so beyond what we traditionally think about in terms of ethnicity, um, leaders taking a more inclusive and expansive view of um, gender identity, right? Um, and, and experience um, and sexual orientation, um, generational diversity, um, geographic um, diverse abilities. But so taking a more expansive view and holding them accountable for that um, as a part of how they make their sourcing decisions, where you go for talent, who you hire, who you develop, who you retain, um, and, and, and who you promote. I think that that's, that's not the entire answer, but I think that that's a big part of the answer. And you maintain the gains once leaders understand that it is a leadership prerequisite, it's not an event, um, and that there's incentive for them to do so and to keep the gains. I, I absolutely agree with Kerrigan says. It really starts, starts at the top and has to be uh, held accountable. But um, in order for not, not, to, not to slide back, you know, as, as leaders of organizations, you know, they need to be two, three, sometimes five years ahead of what's happening out in the, either the labor market or in technology or you know, what, what's going on out there to really protect their own organization. It's because they're making these investments now. And I like the way you say it's not an event. It is something that's gonna make that organization better. So just making sure as they're thinking what's happening going in the future, that their workforce is also moving in that direction. And so they're not spending you know, three years to catch up uh, when, when events do happen that could affect uh, the economy or how organizations are, are sourcing their revenues. This is probably not gonna be wholly satisfying, but um, you know, I like to go back to facts, and, and facts don't always move people or, or convince people to act, but I, two data points that I would just show is, I, I, you know, we've done research that shows that diversity and inclusion, um, when you have a more diverse team, you have better business outcomes, and I think that the business case has been proven, that's one. The second is um, a separate piece of research that's shown that uh, businesses and business leaders who actually took a through cycle view through the last recession, the Great Recession, uh, and continued to invest and continued to repay, retain people uh, actually did better uh, economically, financially, uh, over the medium and to long term. And so I think it's actually in pure rational self-interest uh, to actually continue the, the gains that have been made uh, because it does make organizations better and it does actually deliver better business results. Um, we're going to go to questions in a few minutes, but um, before we do, I have one last question for all of you, which is, you know, most of the people here are from higher education. Um, you talked about this some at the end of your presentation, but, you know, what do you think the vision for higher ed is or should be in this changing landscape of work? Maybe you could identify, like, one or two things that you think are critical. Um, I, I think this was one of the 10 on your list, and it's the one that I experience probably the most often where I'll visit a university, often the provost, she'll talk about any number of changes that they're making to align better with employers. And then I ask, well, which employers have you spoken to and how does it match? And so you really have just a conversational problem. Employers generally are not very articulate about the skills that they need and are not very thoughtful about the true degree no pun intended, um, that credentials do or don't actually align with them. It's you get back to this kind of conventional wisdom conversation that higher ed is failing and, and, and we're hiring people without the requisite skills. But similarly, universities are not doing a very good job in that same kind of translation. So to me, it's all about translation. I'm an optimist also, and I think between the curricular and the co-curricular of a traditional liberal arts degree program, there's a tremendous amount of value that is very relevant to how the workforce is evolving. It's just higher education doesn't communicate that as well as it could, which then requires a conversation about how to do that more effectively. 
Yeah, and I, I would say, first of all, recognize it, uh, the need, but um, there are specific examples. We work a lot with teachers and, uh, and, and run programs for their on experiential learning. It's so really hands-on in the field and how do they really teach students because we've, we've, our studies have showed that students that are actually in the field doing things, and this is really K through 12, um, understand better. And even those students that perform better doing that are the ones that won't perform good when they're trying to learn out of a textbook. But teachers are taught today out of a textbook. And they're taught traditional methods and making sure that they all have to check the box on each one of these uh, subject matters. And, that, and so we found that uh, when we provide that supplemental education to these teachers, they perform at a much higher level. And so are their students. So that maybe that's a practice that can be even, even taught at the, at the uh, um, upper, upper education level. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, our, our organization has a long legacy um, and support for higher education. I'll say as a consumer of the talent, um, I think um, this, is, this form and this discussion is, is a good example, I think, of what the vision should be and what should, should be happening. And I think to help those um, new leaders that are coming out of institutions understand that they have a role in this in terms of being inclusive leaders and making sure they understand the value of inclusion, not only to their personal success, but to whatever organization to which they attach themselves. In addition to the 10 things I will say, I think um, uh, the, the, the two other things that I would say that higher ed needs to do. I think one is there's probably some baseline of things that all higher ed needs to do and understand whether it's about the uh, social emotional skills, whether it's about working with employers and thinking about that. I think that that is kind of baseline that all institutions should think about. But I think the second thing is institution by institution, I think every um, place of higher ed needs to think about who they are and what their role is in the sector and in society and be the best version of themselves, right? And I, I find far too often that there's this copycat me too kind of um, followership in, in higher ed, or if we could just be more like X or be more like Y, and, and that is, I think, not necessarily the right question or, or framing of it. Rather, who are we as an institution? What are our strengths? Who are the students and the populations that we are serving? What's the community that we live in? And how do we be the best version of ourselves in this new particular world? And I think having those hard conversations and moving yourselves towards a future that is aligned with those uh, that history, that legacy, those values, I think is incredibly important uh, and would behoove higher ed to, to do that institution by institution. I think it's about time to go to questions. So if anybody has one, please raise your hands. We have our first one over here. <coughs> I th uh, there are mics coming. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. And my name is Norbert. I actually come from the UN just across, uh, across town, so I hope you guys can make a little trip over there at some point. Um, and I'm here I'm in two, two roles. On the one hand, we are an employer. We have 75,000 people worldwide uh, in 190 countries from 180 countries, so we have a very multicultural workforce. I'm not so representative of that workforce. But, but actually, my question for the panel is in the different role that we have at the UN, looking at the global picture, and you know, Jonathan comes from the Global Institute, and you know, I really appreciated the map of the US that you charted up with all the counties. And I was just wondering how, how the trend that you were describing, how is this trend playing out globally? Mm -hmm. And what are the consequences um, um, then at the, at the end of this automation, AI, also on the global economy? And just in that context, I just want to throw in the, the ILO, who just had the 100th birthday, uh, and I'm sure you know, the International Labor Organization, they just published a report also on the future of work. And there's a lot of concern about, if you look at one very, very, the most developed of all the companies, the US, you're probably going to be in a good place, having higher education institutions thinking about how you can address this. But if you scale this up and you look at the global picture, I'm not so sure, so I just wanted to throw this at the panel. What are your thoughts uh, um, quickly on this? What maybe would be the responsibilities of governments, of private sector, but also of global educational institutions to see how, 
how the impact of all these trends is, is, is not leading to unintended consequences, you know, just like migration, for example, that uh, is, you know, very visible and, and, and feelable. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Thank you. So as the guy who presented all US-centric stuff, by the way, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a crack at this. And by the way, Norbert knows this, but I'm Canadian, which is ironic in all of this. Um, <laughs> Uh, listen, we, we've done the research and, and done the modeling of how this applies actually globally as well. I'm not as well versed on that, and, and I would suggest you go to the website and take a look. But however, uh, not to be the cop out, I do think that there are um, differential impacts when you look at different countries, when you look at developed economy, economies versus emerging economies. Um, the general trends are the same. I think the adoption curves might be slightly different. Um, it certainly, certainly, certainly raises um, real equity concerns across countries and across populations within uh, countries. Um, for example, I think uh, some of the, the gender disparities that I described here, um, while actually not that huge in the U.S., are actually massively different in, in other countries. And so I think that's all worth exploring and, and looking at, at actually um, a, a rather uh, hyper-local level, actually. Um, and that's why we actually did this work on the U.S. side down to the county level, um, because I think it can get a little bit abstracted even when you're talking at the country level. So thinking about it that way uh, is, is important to have that fact base. As it relates to higher ed, you know, different uh, higher ed systems are different across countries. However, I think the general principles that we've been talking about still apply whether it's around how do you think about funding of students, whether it's how do you think about what kind of curricula to develop, how do you in, engage with employers, all these sorts of um, uh, approaches and principles I think still apply regardless of, of what country you're talking about. And by the way, a lot of other countries are much, much better at it than the United States, right? The institutions in other countries are much better than institutions here in the United States on some of those fronts. Um, so I, I think the, the general principles still apply, but uh, the, the particulars are, are quite different. Yeah. I, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I would, I would just add, well, first of all, if you want a better map, I can help you with the visualization there. That's a geographic. <laughs> no, but from, 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 a, from a globalization, I mean, you, you know the statistics are, you know, in 2050, there's going to be another 2 billion people on the planet just creating more pressure on the you know, current sustainability. I think we're consuming, you know, almost one and a half times the world's resources every year. And projections are in 2050, it'll be three times that. And that's just not sustainable. So I think the, the solutions are going to come through technologies. The solutions are going to come from develop, uh, these developing countries. They have to be implemented there. And I think where higher education can play a role, I think most of them have, have footholds in those, those countries that are growing. And how can they take the learnings that are here in the United States and others and just transcend them there? I mean, Eight years ago, I think it is, that when you look at our explorers that we had, almost 80% of them came from the United States, but 80% of their work was outside the United States. And we've taken a model where we've implemented in each country now. So now we're uh, more than 80% of our explorers are outside the country doing the work in country. So they're keeping that knowledge in there. And I think if universities can, can apply that kind of learning, um, it could accelerate some of these changes and the differences that each has. Um, there's a question in the back. Hi, uh, Kathy Hill from Ithaca SNR. Um, thanks to Earl Lewis, we've done some work on liberal arts education and have actually shown that the returns to it are very high. I'm worried at this moment in time when we're thinking about worrying about the future of work that we're actually drawing the wrong conclusions about what we should be doing with higher education and that what we should be doing with higher education is instilling these soft skills and getting more students to have access to a liberal education. And so I guess my question is, um, employers have a particular interest, which is to have a set of skills that are going to benefit them and their shareholders. Why should we think it's a good idea for higher education and individuals to invest in those when employers are not making any long-term commitment to those workers to keep them employed throughout their life? So that's my question. Who wants to take a crack? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're not stumped. Crickets. Well, I'll start. I think it's a fantastic question. And uh, what we've started to do is go on campus 
with our, with our talent, as we call them, again, our, our explorers, and to make connections with students that are, uh, that are in that, that phase of, you know, what do I want to be and, and where am I studying? And uh, we're going to start a program, um, looking at Jason here, because we're going to start this, where we're going to hire, you know, 10 to 20, quote, fellows every year to come into, into organization. And, uh, and the focus will be on, on those liberal arts. We, we recognize the importance of that spatial thinking and good writing skills and, and articulating skills. So we're, we're going to make a commitment to it. it it's, you know, we're small. We're not a big employer. Uh, but that's at least something that we're, we're focused on. And again, bringing those people that uh, had a probably a liberal arts education that went into a career and have them share how, what, what their journey was and that there is a career out there for them. I mean, as you might imagine, I agree with what you described at the beginning of your question, because um, it's the argument I made up here as well. But I think the most literal answer to your question is that the discourse around higher education is that it's a private good. And increasingly, that's the way that people are conceiving it as a private good, where the measure or the value of it is in the economic returns. So as we talk about students as customer and everything that goes around that discourse, it just inevitably pushes higher education to that to that focus, irrespective of whether it's morally correct, you know, in terms of the shift of who covers that responsibility, employers, individuals, and the university, as it continues to move towards being a private good, that's the expectation of the quote unquote customer. It's kind of a depressing statement, but I think it's the answer. Uh, we have a question in the middle here. Hi, uh, Lee Maxey, Mind Max, and I appreciated your comment about diversity. Um, Diverse groups have better outputs, no question about it. However, access um, and equity are issues run higher ed. Not everyone can buy the house for the fencing coach. Um, you know, I mean, so there's there's issues around access, and uh, be interested in your thoughts. Also related to this gentleman's comment about the global access as well. So, what are some of your thoughts around uh, higher ed's responsibility related to access and looking? younger and, and deeper into a, a larger pool of, of people who potentially could provide more diversity? I mean, it's, it's a K through, you know, it's a systematic challenge. You know, if there's inequality and opportunity in the K-12 context, how that flows through um, is, is pretty significant. But I think it, again, comes back to the notion that the more we think about higher education as a private good, then it's more about any one individual's access and the whole notion that a higher ed institution should think about its class in aggregate for some broader outcome, whether it's the quality of the learning environment or a sense of social purpose given the way technology is going to um, disproportionately affect different populations and that creates sort of a moral obligation for universities to get ahead and try to mitigate that disruption. That's just not the way we, we talk about it. Um, so I'm not giving an, if, if someone had the answer to access, I think it's a very multifaceted challenge. Um, and I don't mean to suggest a static view of higher education where it doesn't need to change and the degree is great and just more people need to do it, because part of access is cost, part of access is pathways, you know, into community college and onto higher education, um, the credentialing ladder that people can earn on their way to a degree, but it's just a really difficult discussion because again, we think of higher ed as a private, um, as a private commodity and not serving some social purpose, which I think is a prerequisite to having a truly then honest and aggressive approach to access. Um, because access is ultimately about a collective outcome, either to the learning environment of the university or to society, as opposed to an individual outcome where it's then viewed as zero sum. If we give access to one person, then another person loses it. I don't know if I'm making sense or not. But. Yeah, I, you know, I really think connecting with employers early on and uh, you know that the, the data shows that diverse organizations are more productive but I don't know if everybody knows that and is that that well known that connecting the employee the employee population and the employers with the universities and really helping them understand that and I think that maybe then funds may could, could, could flow there to identify those students early on and that really helps in the recruiting process as well well and I think from a and um, I, I agree and I think from an employer's perspective is you know as we're and we do this as we're out on college campuses and we're, we're talking to folks, um, you know, in K through 12, that we have an obligation that when we're bringing fresh talent into the organization at an internship level, that we ensure that those, those populations are, 
appropriately represented and diverse, right? Because if you think about it, if the goal is to expose young talent to new and different experiences that they'll use over their lifetime, they don't have to come to the table with 20 years of experience in X. And so I think employers being um, really clear about their expectations to provide that talent uh, will be helpful. I'm Earl Lewis, and uh, at one point funding, uh, Kathy, I'm now at the University of Michigan where I run the Center for Social Solutions. And it's always an interesting conversation when we start talking about higher education and employers because most universities are the number one, number two, and number three employers in their metropolitan area. And so we actually don't talk about them as employers making use of their own tools and skills and technologies to inform behavior on their own campuses, let alone impacting the rest of the communities they're adjacent to. So Columbia's relationship to Harlem and what it understands is, is one question. The University of Michigan's relationship to Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti is another one, and I can go across the United States. And so how do we begin to actually reframe this in such a way that there's not such a thing as universities and employers, because universities pr principally are employers? I think it's a great, great point. I mean, uh, universities are huge, and, and if there's faculty, there's staff. If there's a medical center, then that's usually half, if not more, of the entire employment of the, of the university itself as an institution. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think um, where I've been heartened is uh, a bunch of the clients that I have the privilege of working with, the universities, they're actually taking a, a long, hard look at uh, how they are are engaging in, uh, employees, and and particularly on the staff side, but also on the faculty side, but particularly on the staff side, to make sure that they have the skills, that make sure that they have the meaning in their work, and that they're developing, and that they're um, growing themselves, and and making a much more fulfilling um, role for themselves. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the the, the tenth idea I had out there was. Um, how can employers actually embrace some of these technology, uh, sorry, universities embrace some of these technologies in the work that they do? Not from a, by the way, not from a cost saving perspective, but actually from a way to be a participant in the modern world as large employers uh, and also to deliver better outcomes for students, deliver better outcomes for faculty and, and for staff and the like. So I think it's incredibly important uh, on all fronts that, that we think of higher ed, and higher ed thinks of itself uh, not just in its role in society, not just in its role of ed educating um, uh, people, but also as massive large employers uh, in their communities. Hi, I'm Juan Paliso. I, you mentioned earlier in your uh, slides about the GI Bill, that how academic institutions have benefited from the wave of individuals who have leveraged the GI Bill to go to college. And I'm wondering how our companies, um, it, how are they adapting to this generation or this population in addition to how are they capturing this pool of talent? Is it under diversity or is it under another initiative? I mean, I can say at Parchment, we don't do it very well. Um, and you know, you mentioned we're only 150 people, so sometimes that feels big, sometimes it feels small. I mean, in this case, we definitely feel small. The career development expectations, if I'm understanding your question, the career development expectations that, um, you know, I'll, I'll say the younger generation uh, have coming on board, but it's not patterned by age, but if we think about it as, you know, millennials versus then by definition, it's patterned by age. Um, you know, it's completely foreign to me in my own experience, you know, getting to the point where I am. It's foreign to most of my leadership team. Uh, I think we have a leadership team of maybe six or seven. I think one of them does it really well. So I've now seen it done well, which helps me appreciate how poorly I do it. Um, and, you know, at our size, though, we don't have, I guess, the luxury of a special initiative, of an entire team, of any number of other things. It has to sort of be inculcated into just the nature of mentorship. Um, but, uh, but I would say it's something that we're actively struggling with. Um, it very much our internal employee uh, net promoter scores are patterned by generation. 
um, and the expectations of those generations around things like communication, career development, speed and mobility, et cetera, and we're not doing as good a job as we need to. So I, I, would, I would say um, uh, I think there's always room for, um, for, for growth and to do things better. Um, within our workplace, we actually do have three different generations. And I think um, we are being um, consistently responsive to all voices. And so it doesn't necessarily fall under uh, solely a diversity strategy or an inclusion strategy. It's part of a broader growth strategy for the organization, right? Because it's imperative that if, the, if you're seeing um, the growth of uh, Gen um, Y and Z and in the workplace, and they have an expectation for an experience, and you want to go after a certain demographic to capture market spend, you've got to be responsive to those voices. So it's a broader strategy. I just realized this is videoed, and I just said one of my leadership team does it well. So I'm not going to be sharing this video with the rest of you. <laughs> uh, we have time for about one more question, I would you say. Name names. Uh, have you <laughs> at least think it's down. Uh, my name is Susan Hegard, and I lead a compact of 12 states in the Midwest, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. And I'm really interested. This is a great discussion. Thank you. Um, but the, the rusty parts of the map, um, much of the Midwest is pretty rusty. I know Ann Arbor's not that rusty. But um, <laughs> what about the other institutions? Like, you know, I'm not talking about the University of Michigan or the U, or the other, you know, the U University of Minnesota or UW. What about um, this Columbus State, you know, and St. Cloud State, and the smaller regional institutions, both two and four year. Um, you know, part of my job is translating on a, on a daily basis with legislators and others about the value proposition, but um, how about the non-humongous um, public and private institutions? What's their role and how do they fit into all this? I'll take a crack at this, I guess. Uh, I, this goes back to what I was trying to say earlier. I think every institution plays a role. I think higher education is one of the crown jewels of the, of the United States as a society, as an economy, uh, over the past 100 plus years. And it's not just about the leading flagships. It's not just about the leading privates. It is the full range of higher ed options and, and uh, that, I think, will continue to proliferate in a good way as, as we experiment and adapt to this new world. So I think all those institutions that you mentioned, of course, play such an incredibly important role. Uh, and this gets to the notion of understanding their history, what that role has been and can be, and figuring out where they can be so that um, they are contributing to what their students need. Uh, but also that they are, um, frankly, financially sustain sustainable as well, which is an important part of the equation. Um, and so I think that we need to look at the whole landscape. Uh, the, the, the numbers and the, and the data that I went through just suggests a scale of challenge that's going to require a scale of innovation uh, that is on par with what we were talking about um, with the GI Bill or with universal higher high school, right? So I think we need all the different parts of the sector to step up and figure out what their role is going to be in this new world. And, and I'm incredibly uh, optimistic because we have that strength and we have that, um, all, all those different uh, uh, kinds of institutions already. I think we've hit our time limit. So um, thank you so much for being here and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.